I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. I hope when you think of that passage, you don't go, oh, that one, that, that wedding passage. It wasn't written for weddings. You can use it for that, but it was written for the church. And it's important that the church not romanticize this passage and go, oh, that. No, especially this. So 1 Corinthians 13, it comes within the context of Paul's discussion with that church at Corinth about spiritual gifts, and then more particularly about how the church is like a body. And as we each have bodies, I don't know about you, but I would prefer to have two arms, not only one. I would like my legs whole and strong, not amputated, or uh, I don't want to go without fingers or toes. And then the other body parts internal, I think I can use them. And the body finds integrity and strength in its wholeness. And it's in that context that he concludes that discussion, and I will show you still a more excellent way. These words then, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord bless His Word, His Word, to us tonight here from 1 Corinthians 13. We face a question about church because Paul, here in Corinth, is dealing with a church and discussing things about the church. What is the church? What is a church supposed to be? And most of us, think about that simply by habit. If we've been raised in the church, we think about what we're used to, the example our own church has set for us, the church we grew up in. Church is that, that thing I remember or that I'm used to. So such churches, and a whole variety of course, but different habits of behavior, different traits, expectation, worship, commitments, leadership roles, liturgical practices, moral expectations. Oh yeah, that's what the church is. And so with the Christian life. What is a Christian life? What is a godly Christian life? Well, that which is modeled for us, sort of a collective group think of expectations of We permit behavior like this. We disapprove of behavior like that. And then that goes with church. And then 
certain sins are much frowned upon, other sins sort of winked at or just shrugged about. This happens in all kinds of Christian groups. And then the spiritual exercises expected of us from Bible study to prayer and all of that. But if you live somewhere else, you move away from your normal church home, maybe you don't find a Reformed church to go to, or a Presbyterian church, now suddenly you're worshiping with Christians who have different habits and different expectations and different moral models they follow and dispositions of what is normal for church and for being a Christian. Here in Corinth, they would have been talking much about spiritual gifts. What are your spiritual gifts? Tell me what your spiritual gift is. Do you exercise your spiritual gift? And you're thinking, well, we don't talk a lot about that. Well, they did. Do you speak in tongues? No. What's wrong with you? Don't you have this higher, great, decorative gift to fellowship with God and to have enlightenment? And they, dev- they were a church that cared about church leaders. You remember Reverend so-and-so? Now, there was a preacher. There was a leader. Oh, no, it's Reverend such-and-such. Pastor so-and-so. He was the man. If he can't do it, nobody can. Like cheerleaders. And they divided over these kinds of things. And they squabbled like children or teenagers about leadership. And meanwhile, they viewed themselves as it. The Corinthian church, man, we're the church. And back in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, you can get a little sarcasm in the Bible. It shows up very rarely. Sarcasm is a thing to use guardedly, but Paul uses it. You know, we apostles, we're, we're weak, but you're strong. We're, we're fools, but you're wise. Oh, yeah. You know, we're, we're dishonored, but oh, you're honored. You're the it church. And he has to kind of show them up this way. A church arrogant while it's spiritually and literally immoral. Believers taking each other to court. Scandalous immorality in their midst. And they kind of throw up their hands. Well, in fact, they were kind of spiritual babies, nursing infants while they wanted to be superstar Christians. They needed marriage instructions, basics about what it means to have a Christian home. They needed instruction about the Lord's Supper. They couldn't even conduct themselves without this big set of of social strata showing up. Rich people with a big picnic lunch and everything to go with it, all the fixins and other members, meager, poor, going without. What is wrong with you people? Except Paul doesn't address them as you people. He addresses them as Christ's people. People he loves and cares for. And people who were also divided about spiritual gifts Concern for one upmanship, jealousy, self importance, rude to each other, prideful, divided, childish. How about a better way? And that's not something for the church to think about. Once upon a time ago, we're a long established church, we have tradition and we have confessions, and we have habits of life together, and we know what we're doing, I'm still going to say with the Bible, how about a better way? The more excellent way of love is demonstrated here, first in love's necessity, and then love's character, and finally love's permanence. This is the love chapter of the Bible, as you know. But that's the hardest part about being church. I don't find churches that 
put on their marquee. Come be loved. The loving church. Christ's love will fill your hearts. Be welcomed with the love of Christ church. <laughs> well, that's a tall order. Faith church. Redeemer. Our Savior. You know, a Bible town <laughs> or place. Bethany. You know, pick, pick one. First. We were here first. We're the first one. Okay. <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's easy to live up to. Love? Hmm. We all know that some churches could be bickering. CRC, you know, complaining. RCA. <laughs> some churches <laughs> uh, backbiting. <laughs> Presbyterian, you know. There's those kind of churches. But we don't want to advertise ourselves that way either. How about a better way? the way he depicts here. Now, I care about people, but the church sometimes only cares about a small circle of people. There are some churches where I care about my friends, I care about my blood relatives, I care about some people I'm close to, went to school with, and I'm... They're my age, they have my interests, my hobbies, you know, but you see, that's not a better way. That's just sociology. That's not ecclesiology. It's important that we don't turn church into what I call high school. The church has to get over high school. The church is not to be high school. Well, there's this group and there's that group and they're popular and they're good at this and they hang out with this and they, they're tight this way and they're the people who can play music and they're athletic and they're smart and they're this and yeah, you stay to your own and you talk about the others. That's childish. It's not godly. And sometimes in our circles where we've gone to school together and have long memories, we act like a child and speak like a child and behave like a child called high school. And it's time to move on to adulthood. It's time to forget what we remember about someone because that's not loving. It's time to quit identifying people by a failure in their life and look to people as saved by God's grace in Christ Jesus in His blood. This, you see, is a more excellent way. It's the way of love. And so it's important that this better way be practice better way than what? Well, better way than worshiping with low expectations, singing words but not paying attention to them, asking the Spirit to fill us, but not really asking in song, but not really asking the Spirit to lead and guide us, or coming with low expectations and not praying for better ones. Can the preacher impress me? Entertain me? Is God doing really anything? Instead, how about coming with genuine, deep gratitude for God's care with a heart with felt need prayers and unrealized need prayers and not knowing exactly what to pray for prayers and protection for the church prayers and really humble before God prayers and reaching lost people prayers. Isn't that a more excellent way isn't it? The Corinthian Christians were divided over spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, Paul takes up this problem of a body with eyes and ears and head and toes and hands, that kind of thing. And every part needs the other. I don't know about you, if you smash your thumb with a hammer severely, it's not just thumb Oh, too bad for thumb, but the rest of us were going on a picnic. No, <laughs> all the whole body 
participates. A member suffers. A family loses a loved one. A family has a wayward child. We hurt together. We're together as a body of Christ. This is what Paul is trying to show them. Now, the Corinthians were uh, acting as if you know one part gets should get all the glory. Tongues were cool and exotic, and obviously spirit driven manifestations of something, but that silent old person praying faithfully for everyone, that's not public. It's not exotic. It's not, and, it, and it's not an, a person going around boasting about their prayer devotion. It's hidden. But what a spiritual gift for the church. Eyes shouldn't be thinking about ears. Well, so long as I can see, I don't need to hear. Or ears, so long as I can hear, I don't need a sense of smell. Or since I can smell, who needs eyes? None of that. Who wants to go around armless? Well, I got legs. Or legless. Well, I have arms. Yet when church members view one another through a jaded eye, a loveless eye, Ah, we can do without them. Better, good riddance, whatever. Really? Really? So but they, were, they were divided and immature and jealous. And he says, don't you get it? You're, you're one part. You're, you're one thing. You, you can't dispense with one another. Who? When you eat the bread of the supper, you're, that's one thing. It's a communion. There's union and communion. Don't you see that? It's one blood. And God has appointed the church apostles and prophets and teachers. He's given miracles and gifts of healing and helping. And it, well, miracles, healing, and helping and administrating. <laughs> Tongues and interpretation of tongues. He's given prophets and teachers. Here's the bread and butter, the ordinary. But it does all the heavy lifting, you see. Look at the more excellent way. And as he comes then to this excellent way, as he embarks on that, He's wanting to show us that the gifts all need love as the conduit, the kind of the oil that greases the gifts so that what's offered is blessed. Preachers know that. They can work hard over a sermon, labor hard, and then because they're vulnerable and weak, they can have they can be depressed or angry or or struggling or just in an ill mood uh, impatient and then offer the sermon not in love even though it's a well crafted sermon but in frustration and that's not blessed now many of you the oldsters not the youngsters Remember the gong show. Before there was America has talent, got talent. Ah, the gong show. Except the gong show was mostly people getting on stage who were untalented, who would bring their act. And the panel would listen to and watch this act. And if they just couldn't take it anymore because it was so bad, they would get up and with this big mallet hit this big gong upon which enough, it's done, it's over, get off the stage. Well, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm like a gong show contestant, get off the stage. I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Tongues are exotic. Spirit utterance. Spirit utterance that would reflect the revelation of Scripture. 
spirit utterance that if interpreted would say something like you need to love each other and love the Lord. It wasn't divine revelation telling you what job to take. It was utterance that gave expression to revealed Word of God and urging that upon others. That's the kind of utterance it was. Well, Paul goes on with this as he takes up these different things. If I have prophetic powers, every seminarian wants prophetic powers, understand all mystery and all knowledge. Every seminarian, (laughs) just so they can do well in class, wants uh, these kinds of abilities. Every preacher wants this. We want this kind of insight. If, If I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries, all knowledge. If I have all faith, Mustard seed faith, this tiny stuff out of which you can move mountains and have not love, zero. Hmm. The church often doesn't size up gifts that way. The church often looks for the gift of knowledge or the gift of prophetic power or some such thing and well, we'll put up with his ill temper and his irritableness and his snobbishness and conceit. His lovelessness will do without because we have this instead. Really? That's not a more excellent way. That's high school. That's childish. That's looking at external things and not at the Spirit who gives the blessings. That's a lousy way. It doesn't do much good if I came up here and spoke German to you or Japanese. Maybe someone would understand, but not likely very well. No, nor is tongue speaking of much blessing. If it's not offered in love, it's offered in conceit. Look at me. Look at my gift. And then Paul also in Corinthians says, without an interpreter, keep it to yourself. Paul had the gift of tongues which he kept to himself. But love is not something you keep to yourself. Love is that which permeates all that you do and all that you say and all the gifts God bestows so that what is offered in the way of these gifts is offered in a way to be a building and a blessing. Paul amps this all up, doesn't he? He turns to uh, care for the poor and offering your body to hardship even to martyrdom. What about that? Think of the rich young ruler. Jesus comes to this man. He has it all. And he says, you know, well, I've kept all the commandments since I was a boy. Let's see. Let's start with the first one. Love God before everything else. Sell all that you have. Give to the poor. Love your neighbor as yourself and come follow me. Flunk, flunk. But you know what? And he went away sad. But if he had done what Jesus said, he sold all he had and gave to the poor, and he did it without love, he would still be sad. This is what Paul wants us to understand. He's showing us a better way. Love is not a necessity we can do without. Love is a necessity. Otherwise, what we're doing is a gong show Christianity. Get off the stage. Isn't it curious that the church knows that I mean, this is an old, old story. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We go to 1 Corinthians 13 as if it's a magical love chapter. 
And yet that sums up the law and the prophets. It's been there all the time. It's an old, old story. And the summation of the Gospel, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's an old, old story. It's the most important part of the story. It is the story. God's love for His people. So Paul will show us here first love's necessity. You know, whether I, I have faith moving mountains, I have prophetic powers, I'm the greatest preacher who ever lived, whether I have exotic gifts like tongue speaking, or even offer myself in the expenditure of the gospel, I'm expended and expendable without love. Nothing. So what about love's character? Now, when I was a young fellow in my 30s, that's the thing about old people. You only know them as old people. But they were once young people. And you young people, you're, you're eventually going to be old people. But when I, in my 30s, I did a sermon series on this. I had four sermons on verses 4 through the beginning of 8, all by itself. So you can spend a lot of time on love is patient and kind. And love doesn't envy or boast. And it's not arrogant or rude. You can spend a long, a long time uh, investing in what all these different terms mean and their nuance of, of direction and all that. It's not irritable or resentful. doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. Well, we're not going to do that tonight. But we are going to pay attention to the character set up here. As I said, this isn't a passage for weddings, first of all, but for the church. Love behaves a certain way. It has a a disposition about it. When you disapprove of, dislike, hate a person, you're all the more impatient rather than patient. You love your pastor, say, you're patient. You don't particularly like him, you're impatient. If you love someone, you're kindly. You dislike someone, you're likely unkindly. You're not of a loving disposition. You're envious when people are successful. And when you're successful and you're not loving, you're puffed up and proud and boastful. But love isn't proud. It isn't short-tempered. It isn't rude. It, it doesn't snip and snap doesn't put people in their place. I'm first. Recognize me. I get the credit. I'm, I'm getting the credit, right? Self-seeking. Love is patient. God, you're too slow. God, don't you know what you're doing? God, can't you see my needs? God, don't you have an answer? Now! Wrongly, ang easily angered where there's no love, but love isn't that way. I remember what you did. I'll never forget it and I'll never forgive you. Love isn't. That's childish. That's not a better way. That's high school. I'm going to get him. I'm going to retaliate. It's worldly. It's loveless. It's Christless. It's godless. It's ungodly. So when you think about this, you can think about it practically. Who am I impatient with? Who am I unkind toward? 
Toward whom? What am I envious about? You know, envy is a lot worse than jealousy. Jealousy, you just can wish that you had what they had. Envy wishes they didn't have what they had and they would lose what they have. I hope that he wraps that new car around a tree. Envy's vicious. It has an ugly shade of green about it. Think about these things. And then you can ask yourself, who is worthy of your time? Or who do you consider beneath you? Or beneath your concern? Or beneath your prayers? And you know the question itself is an icky, ungodly kind of disposition to be searching in yourself as if you're better than others and you know it. Think about what worldliness really looks like. We usually think about, well, it's a sensuality, it's bad language, it's coarse jokes, it's thieving, it's drinking, carousing, drugging, whoremongering. There, there's un, that's worldliness. Uh, yeah. And not loving your neighbor as yourself. Being rude and impatient and envious and arrogant and boastful is worldliness. Irritable and resentful. Rejoicing at wrongdoing. Ha ha! That shows them they got caught. Ha ha! Rather than rejoicing in truth. Worldliness. It's really important that we grow up and quit being childish in how we measure what is godly. So Paul tells Corinth, he scolds them, conjoles them, and shows them the better way. A church that kind of thought it was all that in a bag of chips. So proud and so needy. Hey guys, where's the love? Don't you see without love, you're just playing games? Won't you pay attention to a more excellent way here? Don't, don't you need, don't you want? Aren't you blessed by a better way? A better way? The church today still needs a better way. The world will pay attention to a better way but not a way of, we're better than you, we're conceited, we matter, you don't. The world smells conceit on the church and flees. Christ was one that people were attracted to. You know, and I know this is, well, we're not Jesus, I know, but we're His people, we're His body, we're to be like unto Him, were to exhibit Him, preach Him, display Him, show people Him. Because He's the one who can attract by the power of the Spirit unbelief to faith. He's the one we run to in our brokenness, in our failure, in our distress. When we've come up short on every end, we don't look to ourselves, or maybe we have, and now we're ready finally to look up for help. We look to Jesus. That's what lost people need. They need Him. That's what leadership in the church needs. It seeks wisdom. It seeks collective insight. But finally, it pleads for Jesus to have mercy. I grew up in a small church in the city of Albuquerque. It was um, a church shy, short on funds, finances, and quite often on talent, on leadership. Particularly in my high school years, it was very short on musical talent. So we had an organist, bless her, who used her gifts best she could, but she wasn't talented at the organ, and she had this odd sense of timing. 
that only she understood. <laughs> and uh, congregational singing was awkward under her use of her gift, but it was still better than nothing. We also had a high school girl who could play piano, but she played it at sprinter speed <laughs> and pounded the keys with all her might. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then we didn't always have enough volunteers for VBS and we had to seek them from Iowa. You know, remember the old swim program and the CRC? You had to get people from across the country to come be the manpower so the church could pull this off. It was a church that was short on spiritual gifts in a lot of ways, but it made them humble and needy and prayerful and loving toward each other. They had to look to God and Christ to have mercy. I've served a church that was wealthy and rich and huge by worldly modern standards, by today's standards. I consider a church of a thousand members a large church. And it was, it suffered with conceit and welcome to our church. I've gone here for 30 years. Oh, didn't recognize you and sometimes a great deal of impatience with one another. Great musical talent, but then they could fight each other about their gifts and how it ought to be. It's easy to have a lot, but not have love. And to forget the more excellent way. You know, pride is ugly on anybody. Conceit isn't pretty on even the most beautiful woman. It's all very un-Jesus-like. A high school mentality of you're in and you're out. You matter, you don't. You're beneath me, you're not in my group, go away. That's not, that's sociology, it's not ecclesiology, it's not the church. And the church suffers when people use their memories to keep records of wrongs rather than celebrating grace of a life transformed and healed. One is the way of love, one isn't. What does love do? I'll tell you what love does. It always protects. It protects always. It comes to the rescue. It rebukes the mean-spirited person. What does love do? It, it protects. What does love do? It, it trusts. What does love do? It hopes. It looks to God for help. It looks to God when it all seems hopeless, but I'll keep trusting and believing that God's going to come through. What does love do? It perseveres always. I've seen sibling love give up on a sibling. I've seen parental love persevere to a deathbed on behalf of a child. Love doesn't give up. And most amazing of all is God's love doesn't give up on us. When we're the prodigal, when we're the extravagant spender, when we chase sin down its alleys and its broad road to destruction, God chases us down. God's love is permanent because it's the better way. And that's where we look at the last part of these verses in 1 Corinthians 13. Love's permanence, its character, 
is defined as a love that never ends. Wow. That's an eternity. One thing you can know for sure with your Lord God, Father, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one thing you can know forever is He'll never stop loving you. Love never ends. To be loved of God is what the devil most wants us not to believe. Maybe if I'm good enough, maybe if I'm better, maybe if I try harder, maybe if I'm thinner, maybe if I'm more talented, maybe if I'm smarter, maybe, 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 maybe. And now if I can only make myself into something, maybe God will approve of me and love me. That's not how it works. He loves you while you're yet a sinner and unlovable. Prophecies, they're going to give way and go away. (laughs) Preachers, sermons, fat theology books, they'll cease. Knowledge, all that big stuff of seminary professors and all of that, that passes away. Now, Tongues, that too. It, it's going to suffer the gong show. Get off the stage. We're done with it. We don't need it. Paul is very clear that these things cease. Knowledge ceases. It passes away. And then he explains, you know, right now we know in part. We don't know everything. A preacher preaches from the revealed revelation does the best he can with what God has given us for the purpose in which he's given it. But it's still minuscule. It's just in part. The knowledge we have and the convictions we hold of faith and the confessions we make, we're doing the best we can under God's blessing, but it's small. This knowledge too will pass away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The point of that is not to make relative what we do. The point of that is to make humble what we do. To make small and dependent what we do. And so he says, let me get the point across this way. When you were a child, how did you behave? Well, I know how I behaved as a child. I woke up before the whole family. If cartoons were on, I watched cartoons. If the weather was good, I'd go outside and throw rocks at things And because I lived in the Southwest. You, know, you don't have greenery, you have dirt <laughs> and rocks and lizards and bugs and so I went out there and I played I thought like a child I behaved like a child I had my Ford Apache set remember those I had my Hot Wheels sets with leaping cars and all of that I, I had my Mattel rifle like the rifle man and I it had a little spring-loaded cartridge with a little plastic gray bullet that actually shot in those days you could you know you could have fun as a child in those days Um, and various other toys I, I was a child what can I do for fun today I wasn't worrying about taxes or bills or or grades in school or anything I was I was a child I thought like a child acted like a child spoke like a child and then when I was 25, I became an you know, That's today, right? When you're 35, you become a man. And we went, mustn't pick on that generation. No, eventually you put those things away. He's applying this to church life. Don't do church like a child. Don't behave as church like children, like high schoolers in a pecking order. Don't drag this ungodliness into the place of God. 
Don't you know you only know in part? You prophesy in part. You confess in part. You're small. You're needy. You're weak. But a day comes when you'll be you'll have full knowledge as you're now already fully known and loved. Fully known and loved. Wow. Because most of us hide everything that's unlovable. I don't want you to know this. Don't know that. Forget, don't, don't see this. And that's why he concludes the way he does. Fully loved people, fully known people. And Paul says, yeah, there, there's three that remains. These three, faith, hope, and love. But God doesn't need faith or hope, but He is love. The greatest of these is love. I wish it was my greatest gift or the thing that most characterized me as I seek to exercise gifts God has given me. I've known elders in the church, my own mother, different church members through the years in various places who seem to excel at the gift and the blessing of love more than other things. My mother did not have great knowledge. She didn't have the gift of tongues. She wasn't prophetic. But she did exercise a love that believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never gave up on a child, on a son, and never lost her way because she knew she was loved. You say, well, how do I get this love, Pastor? It's not a matter of here's the five steps. How about we simply meditate on what Paul has given us here and believe it? Believe you're loved. Believe you're wanted. Believe in all your lack of giftedness and talent, and specialness. Oh, wow, the world we live in of influencers and how many people care about me and how many people are looking at my page. Oh my, it's so ungodly. It's so unchristian. It's so loveless. How about God loves me? Christ died for me. He desires me because He does. Because He's good and kind and loving and gracious and patient. He's all the things that Paul talks about here. How about because Christ is who He is. And even forgives me with all my childishness and my failures and backslidings and lack of maturity. He still loves me. He still calls me forward. Still calls me to Himself still calls me to follow Him. Still calls me and us to the better way. Amen. Lord, bless Your Word to us. May it not be in one ear and out the other. May we give attention to these things. Because our lives hurt because the devil lies to us, because we believe lies, because the world hates us and hates You, but You so love a world, You call us, You call Your people to Yourself. May we believe we're loved and therefore may we love and now serve You. Grant us these things we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.